Welcome into the Best in Paranormal Podcasting. This is Darkness Radio. I'm Jim Dennis. Uh, interesting show for you today, folks. We're going to uh, go literally into the rabbit hole. I mean, not literally into the rabbit hole. If I said we were literally going into the rabbit hole, uh, I'd be lying. But we're going into the rabbit hole as an into the rabbit hole series. And uh, it's going to be a good one indeed. Our guest today is Micah Dank. Micah T. Dank was born in 1983 in Oceanside, New York. From a young age, he had wanted to be a writer, uh, coming from a family of writers. His father was a producer and radio news editor at CBS News in Manhattan, and his grandfather was a producer at CBS News. There's a background I'd like to uh, dig into. Uh, Micah was an actor in high school and became interested in writing from his 12th grade English teacher, Russell Reed. Uh, From there, he majored in English at uh, SUNY Albany and transferred down to uh, CUNY Hunter College in uh, Manhattan and earned his bachelor's degree in language literature and criticism. It wasn't until he moved to Boston for a new job that he became interested in the esoteric sciences, including the astrology and uh, astrotheology uh, prevalent throughout his book series. Now, his book series is Into the Rabbit Hole, he also has uh, Beneath the Veil, The Sacred Stones, The Secret Weapon, Pangea's Pandemic, The Hidden Archives, and The Final Type. We're going to kind of be all over the board today, folks, yet we're, we're not. We're going to focus on some things today, uh, which are going to kind of blow your mind a little bit. So let's bring in, without uh, further ado, Micah Dank. Uh, Micah, thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, so let's, uh, let's start this a little bit with, uh, kind of introducing people to a little bit of your, your introduction to this part of the, the supernatural and how you came about this and, and, and your interest in this. Tell us a little bit about what kind of sparked your interest. So I've been studying the Bible for about 30 years now. Okay. Okay. Um, I was raised in a religious household. I never took to it, though. Okay. And um, about 10 years ago, I got involved with something called astrotheology. I started studying. I came across two videos, and it kind of blew my mind. And to be honest, it's what I wanted to share. It's what I wanted to do. And this astrotheology is the science. It's the basis of the Bible. It's, it's the complete backstory and everything of the Bible. So what I've done is I've been doing my own work on it. Mm -hmm. And I have a six books out series so far, soon to be eight. My publicist is actually pitching it to TV producers um, because we're going to try and turn it into a TV series. Okay, Uh, That's what we decided to do with it. And uh, what I'm going to talk about now is astrological hidden codes and how the Bible is just basically an encoded astrology book. Now, interestingly enough, and let me ask you this, I know I, I... I, I'm trying not to jump in and put the, the cart before the horse here, but, you know, Dan Brown came out a long time ago with the Da Vinci Code and, and, and put forth his spin on things. How does this differ from, from it, the Da Vinci Well, because, Code? okay, so my writing style mm-hmm. is based off of Dan Brown's writing style. He's one of my literary heroes. Okay. Just the cryptograms, the anagrams, the puzzles, that's how I write, too. Okay. Okay. Um, it is, it is very similar in a lot of ways, but it's very different okay. in the fact that this is actually true. Oh, okay. okay? This is actually the, the hidden truth, whereas he put a spin on it. Okay. How, how so did he put, what spin did he put on it? That, that well, that Jesus um, had a bloodline and that he had children. When the truth of the story is, is that Jesus actually never existed. He's a solar deity. He's just like ancient. He's just like Horus. Okay. From the Egyptian times. Okay. He's just like Mithra Tammuz. He's just an ancient solar god. Okay. And there's plenty of information to corroborate that, which I'm going to go through. Sure. Sure. All right. Well, let's begin. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, astral theology in, in, in the beginnings and what we should know just as a basis with it. What, what should we know just to begin? So, astral theology is basically the mythology surrounding the zodiac. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm going to do a presentation for you. Sure. But I want you to know that um, aside from the books that I'm going to talk, talk about from the Bible, the books that I've decoded with astrotheology are the book of Matthew, the book of Revelation, the book of Enoch, Jubilees, the gospel of Thomas, Mary Magdalene, Melchizedek, Philip, and Judas, the gospel of John, the book of Psalms, the gospel of Q, books that are not biblically related. 
the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, the Enuma Elish, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Code of Hammurabi, the Quran, the Egyptian Book of the Dead. All these books have an astrotheological basis to them. It's the science that all the, that they all basically wrote uh, the books in. So I usually say this, too, at the end, but I say it first uh, here. This is a line from John Dominic Croissant where he basically says, my point once again is not that these ancient people told literal stories and we are now smart enough to take them symbolically, but that they told them very symbolically and we are now dumb enough to take them literally. And that's the truth. Okay, these are very deeply encoded astrological metaphors that I'm going to teach you how to read today. Okay. Right. So I say employ your time in improving yourselves by other men's writings so that you shall come easily by what others have labored hard for. And that basically is a nice way of saying pick up somebody's book. They have put a lot of time and effort into studying this and um, you'll learn quickly what took them for a long time to learn. And that's basically what I do now. The ancient Holy Bible is known of seven sciences. It's, it's made up of what's known as the seven sciences. The scriptures are metaphysical, astrological, which I'm going to get into, anatomical, alchemical, spiritual, esoteric, and mythology. They are not literal, historical, reality, or original. Okay? They're really not even original. They're none of those things. Okay. Okay. The astrotheology in the Bible, if you look at the Zodiac wheel here, Capricorn's at the bottom and Cancer's on top, that's how the wheel should be shown. Okay, any deviation from this, and it's incorrect. Okay, this is how it should be shown. I'm going to explain why. Now, <clears throat> it goes back to the Lascaux Caves, okay, astrotheology, which are 40,000 years ago. And as you can see here, there's an article that says world's oldest cave paintings show human understood complex astronomy 40,000 years ago. So what happened was a little while back, these kids, these teenagers went into the Lascaux Caves and it's in Lascaux, France. That's why it's called the Lascaux Caves. They went into them. And when they went into the back of the caves, they saw something like this. OK, and if you see, you can see this, right? I can see, but let's describe it for our audience. Sure. OK, so the top picture is two bulls standing off. Mm -hmm. uh, the one on the right is the many faces of the lion and the one on the bottom is a horse. OK, mm -hmm. now um, the. In astrology, the bull, is Taurus, I mean, the bull is Taurus, the lion is Leo, and the horse is Sagittarius. It's just missing the guy with the bow and the arrow. So what they did was they uh, quickly figured that out. So what they did was they brought in an astrologer with a computer because we have the technology to do it now. Mm -hmm. What they did was they were on the sky back 40,000 years because when they carbon dated the wall, it came out to 40,000 years. So they were around at 40,000 years and they printed out the star maps as it was back then. And they superimposed it onto the caves and all the constellations lined up. Okay. So we've had an active knowledge of this for 40,000 years. Okay. It's the oldest science and that's why it's the basis of everything. Okay. There's questions you can ask in the Bible. Okay. How Jesus was able to heal the blind, how he walked on water, how mm -hmm. he turned water into wine, why he had 12 disciples, why he was betrayed with a kiss by Judas, why he was dead for three days, why is his birthday on December 25th? All that is astrology. And I'm going to explain that to you. Okay. So Genesis 1.14 says, let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them be signs to mark the seasons, days, and years. And that's what it is. The sun tells the time of the day. The moon tells the time of the night. Uh, and the uh, the signs, the zodiac mentions the seasons, days, and the years. They break it down. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to teach you the 12 signs. Okay. You may know them. Okay. You may not. Sure. But I'm going to teach you the 12 signs. I'm going to teach you code words for them. Okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use those code words to break down every biblical verse moving forward. Okay. Okay. So the first sign is Aquarius, which is represented by the man with the water pitcher. Mm -hmm. So whenever you hear son of man or man, because Aquarius is the sign of the man, whereas Virgo is the sign of the woman. Okay. Man baptism. Cause this is how you baptize someone with the man with the water pitcher, pouring it out onto the baby's head, mm -hmm. water pitcher, fountain, stream, river, pond, lake, Creek, bodies of water. Yep. They're talking about Aquarius. Okay? okay. Now the same water examples can be placed in Pisces too. Cause Pisces is actually the mutable water sign. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Now the third is Aries. Uh, Aries is the ram, in which you have March 21st, which is the spring equinox. It's a 12-hour day and a 12-hour night. It's also the Passover, right? Mm -hmm. You celebrate Passover in Aries. Passover is when the Jewish, uh, in the Torah, it says that the uh, the uh, angel of God, or the angel of death, I should say, passed over the Egyptian households. And anyone that didn't have the ram or the lamb 
Aries the Ram. They didn't have the Ram or the Lamb's blood smeared on their doorposts. Yep. The firstborn son was killed. In Christianity, this evolves and it becomes the resurrection of God's son, S-U-N. So you get Easter. So you, and then in astro theology, the Passover is literally March 21st, where the sun passes over the equator and back on its way to its height in the summer solstice. So you have three separate meanings talking about astro theology there. So whenever you hear ram, lamb, shepherd, ram's horn, you're talking about Aries. Then Taurus is the bull. When you look at the sky and you see Taurus during the season where it's supposed to be, you know that you need to put the plow on the bull so that you can plant the seeds so you can harvest in Virgo and Libra. Okay. So whenever you hear bull, ox, calf, or cow, cow being the female bull, you're talking about Taurus. Okay. <laughs> Gemini is the twins. It's the story of Castor and Pollux Troy, whose sister was Helen of Troy. It's the story of Achilles. So whenever you hear twins or brothers, you're talking about Gemini. Okay, now Cancer is the crab, and it's the sideways moving creature. The crab shuffles to the side, whereas humans don't. We only shuffle to the side if we're doing a sports drill. <laughs> we walk front to back. We walk diagonal. We do not walk side to side. Yep. We do not shuffle unless you're dancing or doing a sports drill. <laughs> the crab does. And the sun does the same thing in cancer, too. So on December 25th, the sun will rise a degree on its axis. The next day, it'll rise an additional degree. The next day, an additional degree. It'll keep doing this. The days get longer. The nights get shorter until it hits June 21st, which is the summer solstice. That's the longest day of the year. It'll hit that height. Once it's at that height, it stays there for three days. It stays at that height for three days, hence walking sideways. It's a metaphor. Okay. Then on June 25th, it drops a degree, and then it continues to drop a degree every single day until it hits December 21st. On December 21st, the sun doesn't rise above the horizon. That's the winter solstice. It's the shortest day of the year. The ancients used to look at the sun not rising above the horizon and say the sun was dead. And then it walks sideways for three days again. So suddenly God's sun was dead for three days. Uh -huh. Whereas on December 25th, the, it's born again, the light of the world, the only begotten son comes back to life. Okay, so whenever you hear crab or beetle, that's talking about cancer. The Egyptian time, uh, the crab was known as the scarab. Okay, okay, so that's why it's the crab or the scarab, right? In cancer, Leo is the king, he's the lion, he's the king of the jungle. The ruling planet of Leo is actually the sun. So, whenever you hear lion, lioness, or cub, you're talking about Leo, Virgo is the woman holding the stalk of wheat. So remember before we said you plant in Taurus, you look at the sky, you see the bull, you put the plow on the bull on earth. Mm -hmm. Well, the virgins would cultivate the wheat in Virgo in order to make the bread for the year. So whenever you hear virgin, wheat, grain, seed, barley, corn, grainy things, things that you harvest, that's always done in Virgo. Libra is the justice, it's the scales, it's the balance, the just one. The reason it's known as the justice, the reason it is scales, is because it judges God's son as it passes over the fall equinox and begins its descent into winter, into cold, into death. See, it's celebrated as Passover and the resurrection in the spring when it passes over the equator, but now it's being sentenced to death. The sun is going to go into the winter months. It's going to start to get cold. Okay. Okay. So um, Libra is also wine season. Okay. So when you plant the grapes in Taurus, right, you can harvest them in Libra and crush them and make the wine. Libra is also when you crush the olives and make olive oil. So whenever you hear law, judge, justice, the just one, divorce, marriage, court, lawly things, you're talking about Libra. Whenever you're talking about wine, grapes, or olives, or oil, you're talking about Libra too. Okay. Then Scorpio is the scorpion, and he is known as the betrayer. When a scorpion bites you, it leaves an imprint in your skin that looks like a pair of lips. It's why the mafia has the kiss of death. That's where they get that from. All right. Okay. Now, it's why Jesus was betrayed by Judas with the kiss. There's 12 disciples. Each one of them represent a zodiac sign that have something to do with, with uh, the information that I'm giving you. Okay. So, basically, the sun is judged in Libra, and it's betrayed in Scorpio. Finally, in Sagittarius, this is where the bow and the arrow shoot the sun and inflict further punishment on the sun. This is where the sun dies. Why? Because the last day of Sagittarius is December 21st. The sun is at its lowest point. It cannot rise any lower. It's dead. So they made all these mythological stories surrounding about that. Okay. It's why Jesus was dead for three days, because it walks sideways for three days. And then it rises back a degree on December 25th or his birthday or the day of the birth of many ancient gods. So whenever you hear horse, bow and arrow, spear, or horseman, you're talking about Sagittarius. Then finally, you have Capricorn, who's the goat. 
because he likes to climb the mountain. And you people listening can't see this, but if you look at the zodiac wheel and you have Capricorn at the bottom and Cancer on top, the sun starts to climb during Capricorn. It starts to climb up the mountain on its way back to its height to June 21st. This is known as the hero's journey by Joseph Campbell. Okay, so it starts to climb in Capricorn, just like the goats climb up the mountain, you know, with with no regard for themselves. They just go up on a two inch ledge and climb up on a steep mountain. Okay, so those are the signs. Okay. Okay. Yep. Now, there, there are names. Hold on a sec. Sure. There are names for Jesus that are given to him in church that are astrological based on what I've told you. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. When the sun is in Capricorn, the goat, he's called the scapegoat of Israel. When Jesus, the son, S-U-N of God, is in Aquarius, he's called the son of man, the sign of the man, Aquarius. When he's in Pisces, the two fish, he's the fisherman of men. And it's also why you could feed the masses with two fish. When he's in Aries, the ram, he's known as the lamb of God or the good shepherd. When the sun is in Leo, the lion, he's known as the lion of Judah. Okay, this lady holding the stalk of wheat, Virgo, he's born of a virgin and he's called the bread of life. Libra is the scales of justice. He's known as the just one. And he's betrayed in Scorpio. He dies in Sagittarius on December 21st, right? Mm -hmm. And it's also why he's worshipped on the sun day. Oh, okay. All right. Now, let me just move forward to this. Let's start decoding some phrases with that. Sure. Proverbs 1618, pride comes before the fall. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is taken to mean that your ego will be your downfall, right? That's how you've always heard it. Taken. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, a group of lions is called a pride. So pride is the lion. Lion is Leo. Leo is in July and August. That comes right before the fall. L quite literally. Yeah. 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 So that's how you take it astro theologically. Now, the next one is uh, the book of Micah, my namesake. Yes. Micah 5 2. Mm hmm. He predicts that the Savior will come from a town called Bethlehem. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. However, in Hebrew, Bethlehem is a combination of two words. It's Bet, B-E-T, which means house, and Lechem, L-E-H-E-M, which means bread. So Bethlehem means house of bread. Well, each zodiac sign is called a house. It's called a house. It's called the neon. It's called a mansion in the Bible. That's what they use. It's called an age. They're referring to that. Okay. okay. So the house of bread is Virgo, who's the virgin. So if the savior is coming from Bethlehem, he's coming from the house of bread. He's coming from a virgin. So the savior comes from a virgin. Okay. So that's encoded that way. And you can kind of get ahead of the story if you read it this way too. Now I'm going to read you a much longer passage that has eight signs in it. Well, technically 10, but we'll get into that. Deuteronomy 32. He gave them honey from the cliffs and olive oil from the rocky ground. He gave his people butter from the herd and milk from the flock. He gave them lambs and goats. They had the best rams from Bashan and the finest wheat. They drank the best wine made from the juice of red grapes. But Jeshurun became fat and kicked like a bull. So let's read that again. He gave them honey from the cliffs and olive oil. Remember olive oils? That's Libra. That's when you make the olives yep. into oil. Mm -hmm. Okay. He gave people butter from the herd and milk from the flock. He gave them lambs. Lambs are Aries. Mm -hmm. And goat, that's Capricorn. They had the best rams, that's Aries, from Bashan and the finest wheat. That's Virgo, the lady with the wheat stalk. They drank the best wine made from the juice of red grapes. That's Libra. That's when you press the grapes. Mm -hmm. But Jeshurun became fat and kicked like a bull. That's Taurus, the bull. Now, there's two signs that I didn't go into real quick. He gave them honey from the cliffs. Okay. In the sign Cancer, there's a group of stars called the Beehive Cluster. Okay. It's, a, it's known as an asterism. So that's metaphorically where the honey comes from, the sign of cancer, the beehive cluster. Milk from the flock comes from the Milky Way galaxy. And the Milky Way galaxy has been called the Milky Way galaxy as far back as the Egyptian Book of the Dead. So it's always been known as the Milky Way galaxy. So the milk comes from the Milky Way galaxy, which center is in Sagittarius. Okay. So your land from the beehive cluster to the Milky Way galaxy, from cancer to Sagittarius, that's your land of milk and honey. It's not a place on earth. It's a, it's a metaphysical, um, it's in the heavens. Okay. Okay. They're all, they're all metaphors like that. Now watch what I do here. You can see this, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Okay. Jesus led his disciples to the Mount of Olives after his last Passover so he could teach them a few more things, pray, then wait for Judas to betray him. While walking to the Mount of Olives, he gave the parable of the true vine. Now watch this. Look at the wheel. Passover takes place in Aries, right? So you see Aries on the left? Yep. Okay. We're going to make patterns now, okay? You have, you have two different kinds of patterns that you can make. You can make neighboring signs or connecting signs, okay? So Aries connecting would be Taurus or Pisces. And just so we're keeping the audience up to date, Aries is at nine o'clock on the wheel. Yes. Just, Aries just, is at nine o'clock. Yeah, just so then, they can get this picture in their mind. Right. Along and, then, with and then Taurus is the next sign over, and then Pisces is the previous sign. So Aries, you could talk about the ram. You could talk about the uh, spring equinox. Mm-hmm. You can talk about – and then in Taurus, you could talk about the bull mm-hmm. or when you plant. In Pisces, you can talk about the fish. Or water, right? Remember mm-hmm. the keywords that I gave you? Yep. yep. Okay, so we're in Aries right now. That's when Passover is. We're right after that, he walks to the Mount of Olives. Well, the Mount of Olives is in Libra. So you go directly across the Zodiac from Aries to Libra. They're known as cross signs or opposing signs. Very powerful in astrology. Not only am I going to show you patterns throughout the Bible um, of, of, uh, of Zodiac signs, but they're always going to make a pattern too. They're going to be the cross sign or the neighboring sign. That's how you know they were done. Okay. Okay. So we're in Aries Passover. We go to Libra, the Mount of Olives. Okay. Okay. They're in Libra. They're waiting for Judas to betray him. Well, the next sign over from Libra, the connecting sign is Scorpio. And I told you that Scorpio is the betrayer, right? Right. Okay. So you're going from Aries to Libra across the wheel, and then you're waiting for the next sign while you're in Libra. You're still talking about the law, right? You can mm-hmm. talk about the law, mm-hmm. olives, or wine, right? Right. They're waiting for Judas to betray him. In Libra, he gives the parable of the true vine, or vineyard, or wine press, whatever you want to call it. It's still Libra. Mm-hmm. So that's how we start to decode things, okay? Genesis 1-7, and God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. The firmament is the dividing lines between the zodiac signs. This is, the firmament is not a flat uh, a dome over a flat earth. That's not what the firmament is. It's a dividing line between zodiac signs. Okay? okay. Now the two water signs that I was talking about, Aquarius and Pisces, right? Those are the two water signs. So the firmament dividing the waters, which are under the firmament from the waters, which are above the firmament. So you can see here, the dividing line between Aquarius and Pisces, one is above the firmament. One is below the firmament. It divides the lines. The reason you have handover dates or cusps or firmament days is because it keeps one sign from spilling over into another to make this one giant thing. Okay. Okay. All right. Now let's go into revelation. Okay. All right. Revelation four, seven, the first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying Eagle. The first living creature was like a lion. That's Leo. The second was like an ox. That's Taurus. The third had a face like a man. That's Aquarius. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Now, in astrology, the Scorpio scorpion is the belly crawling creature. It's the lowest form of life on Earth. In the Bible, uh, the snake loses his legs and he's made to slither on his belly after the deception in the Garden of Eden. So it's a punishment from God to crawl on your belly. But its evolved form in astrology becomes the eagle, which is the highest flying form of life on Earth. Okay, so the eagle becomes Scorpio. So you have Leo, Taurus, Aquarius, and Scorpio. Those are the four fixed signs of the zodiac. The four fixed signs, I meant there's mutable signs, there's cardinal signs, there's fixed signs. The reason they're called fixed is because they're fixed in their season. Leo's right in the middle of summer. Taurus is in the middle of spring, Aquarius winter, and Scorpio or the eagle is right in the middle of fall. Now watch what happens. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Okay? Mm -hmm. Lion, Leo, man, Aquarius, those are opposing signs. There's the pattern. Ox, Taurus, eagle, Scorpio, those are opposing signs. You see how it makes a red X through the zodiac wheel? Yep. Yep. Okay? So that's what this one is talking about. Yeah, they're they're directly opposing of each other. Yeah. So you're always, like I said, we're... We're going to constantly see patterns, opposing signs and neighboring signs. And we're going to remember the key words that each zodiac sign represents. Revelation 12, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant 
and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to earth. Okay, there's people that believe there's going to be a dragon in the sky during the end days that are crying out to a pregnant woman. But it's not. It's just astrology poetry. Watch. A woman clothed with the sun is the sun clothed in Virgo. It's just a metaphor. Mm -hmm. If the sun is in Virgo, the moon will be at her feet. Okay, it's just a metaphor. Because basically, if the moon is up, the sun is at her feet. If the sun is up, the moon is at her feet. That's all they're saying. Mm -hmm. Now, if the sun is in Virgo, there's 12 zodiac signs. It's a 24-hour-a-day clock. So the sun spends two hours a day in each sign. If you follow the clock correctly, the sun is in Virgo from 4 to 6 p.m. So the sun is still out. So if the sun is out, the moon is at her feet. Now, another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous dragon. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to earth. There's a constellation called Draco which is the dragon, which people have heard of. Its tail goes from Aries to Sagittarius, which is four twelfths of the sign or one third of the stars out of the sky. Okay. So you see how this is starting to shape up to just be like star poetry, right? Right. Do you have any, any questions so far before I keep going? Well, uh, yeah, I do have one question and that has to do with revelations. I mean, we, we go to revelations in some of these, but a lot of people and especially biblical scholars have, have questioned that, Revelation was really just, and the end of the world in general was just a, a writing about Nero. Um, there's, a, there's, 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 um, there's plenty of uh, examples of Nero. For example, the number six 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 in the Bible, or the fact right. that he was an evil emperor. Yes, there's plenty of talking about that too. But I've decoded the entire book of Revelation, and I can, I'm showing you some examples. But basically, sure, sure. all the passages can be decoded with this. So with let me let me ask you this, Micah: Does the the astrology part of Revelation tie into anything having to do with Nero, or am I jumping ahead? Um, that I know of, no. Okay. That I know of, no. Remember how I mentioned this: the, the sci- there's seven sciences. Mm-hmm. Right. I mentioned that at the beginning. I mentioned the seven sciences at the beginning. I just explained one of them. Right. So this is not by any means a complete breakdown of the Bible as it should be. Right. This is the astrological breakdown of the Bible. Right. Let's let's do this before we move any further, Micah, we have to take our only break of the program. So let's do that. When we come back, we'll pick this back up. And uh, we'll we'll continue on. We're talking about astrotheology in the Bible. Our guest is Micah Dank. Uh, when we come back, we'll continue down this quote unquote rabbit hole, which is uh, actually one of the the name of the series that uh, that Micah has out there uh, into the rabbit hole. Uh, Micah, tell people where they can uh, pick up your books. Yeah, you can get it on Amazon. Uh, you can reach out to me on social media. I'm on uh, on Twitter. I'm real Mister Dank. Spell out Mister. I'm Micah Dank on Facebook and Instagram. I sell signed copies, too. A lot of people tend to get them through me signed. Um, They'd rather me get the money than Bezos. Uh, If you're interested, just reach out to me or I'll reach out to you on social media. But you can get them on Amazon, too, or wherever the books are sold. Okay. When we come back, uh, more astrotheology in the Bible. It's coming up next here on The Best in Paranormal Podcasting. This is Darkness Radio. Welcome back to the Best in Paranormal Podcasting. This is Darkness Radio. I'm Tim Dennis. Uh, We're speaking with Micah Dank, and we're talking astrotheology in the Bible and and, uh, fascinating stuff. We're we're talking actually about star signs and how, uh, really, there's there's a lot more star signs in the Bible than there is actual factual accounts in the Bible. Um, And uh, Micah's walking us through that. Now, Micah, let's pick up where we uh, where we left off here and and, and tell us uh, now we were talking actual. uh, I think we had left off with. uh, uh, Revelation 12. Revelation 12. Right. And and we're moving on now from Revelation 12 to Matthew 10, 16, I believe. is Matthew 10, 16. This is a famous line. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, the sheep is Aries the lamb, the ram, the wolf is the constellation lupus who borders the Libra line. Now Aries and Libra are opposing signs. So there you see 
a pattern right there. Okay, that's what they're trying to convey. Okay. So I've given examples of astrotheology in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. At this point, you could say I've been cherry picking verses. That's fine. So we're going to start to decode longer and longer passages. Okay. Okay. So let's start with the book of Job. Are you familiar with it? Uh, slightly from my Catholic background. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Can you explain to everybody who Job was and what the story behind him basically was real quick? Or would you like me to do it? Uh, go. You go ahead and do it. I'll leave it up okay. to you. I, I so think he, you're probably Job more was, versed than I am. So Job was a righteous man who had land. He had animals. He had family. He had money. Mm-hmm. Satan goes up to God and says, the only reason he's righteous or the only reason he prays to you is because he has everything. So God basically sees that as a bet. And he says, you can do whatever you want to him, but you cannot take his life. So Satan goes, okay, so little by little, the animals start to die. His family starts to die. Uh, he starts to lose his money, right? This sounds familiar? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then basically what happens is at one point he's sitting on a rock and he cries out to God. And then this is one of the times in the Bible where God speaks, Okay, Mm -hmm. so I'm going to read you Job 38, 32, which is what God says. Now, the first sentence that I read you is from the Bible. The second sense sentence that I read you in every sentence is going to be the uh, astrological interpretation. Okay. Okay. Job 38, 32. God first says, can you lead forth the Maseroth? The Maseroth literally translates to the Zodiac. So his first question is, do you know your Zodiac? He, He openly asks him that. Over time, the word Maseroth evolves and it becomes Mazalot, which evolves again and becomes Mazel Tov, which means good fortune from the stars in Hebrew. Okay. okay? And you know how old Mazel Tov is, so you can only imagine how old the word Maseroth is. Right. So what is the Lord's challenge to Job? The first two questions he says, he says, can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? Can you loosen Orion's belt? Well, those are open, obvious star metaphors, right? Mm-hmm. Then he says, can you bring forth the constellation in their seasons or lead out the bear with its cubs? Now, the constellations are the zodiac above, and the bear and its cubs are Ursa Major, the Great Bear, and Ursa Minor, part of the Big Dipper. Then he says, who can tip over the water jars of the heavens? Well, that's Aquarius. We saw that earlier with the man with the water pitcher pouring it out. Do you hunt the prey for the lioness and satisfy the hunger for the lions? Well, that's Leo. Okay. Who provides food for the raven? That's the constellation Corvus, which means raven and borders on Virgo. Do you watch where the doe bears her fawn? Riga, which means deer, is located in Orion. Who let the wild donkeys go free? That's a Celis borealis, which means donkey and is located in Cancer. It's near the beehive cluster. Will the wild ox consent to serve you? That's Taurus. The wings of the ostrich flap joyfully. That's Lambda Achille or Al Thaliman, which means two ostriches in Arabic. Do you give the horse its strength? It laughs at fear, afraid of nothing. It does not shy away from the sword, the quiver. So we have the horse and we have the quiver with the arrows. So we know that's Sagittarius with the bow and the arrows. Does the eagle soar at your command and build its nest on high? Aquila is the Latin name for eagle and is a constellation a few degrees above the celestial equator. The last thing he says is, can you pull in Leviathan with a fish hook? Leviathan, for anybody that knows anything, was the ancient fish god. So that's Pisces the fish. So you can see here that not only does he say, um, do you know your Maseroth? Do you know your Zodiac? And then starts with two open metaphorical questions, but the rest are just encoded astrotheologically. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Psalms 104. He sends forth springs in their valleys. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and wine, which makes man's heart glad so that he may make his face glisten with oil. The high mountains are for the wild goats. He made the moon for the seasons. The sun knows the place of its setting. The young lions roar after their prey. The springs are Aquarius, the water. The wild donkeys are Salus Borealis, which are in Cancer, which I meant. The cattle is Taurus the bull. The wine is Libra, remember? And the oil is Libra as well. Mm -hmm. The wild goats are Capricorn. The moon for the season and the sun knows its place of its setting is openly talking about the sun and the moon. The lions roar after their prey or Leo. Let's do one more from Psalms. Psalms 147. He gives to the beast its food and to the young ravens which cry. He does not delight in the strength of the horse. He does not take the pleasure in the legs of a man. He makes peace in your borders. He satisfies you with the finest of the wheat. He gives snow like wool. So ravens are the constellation Corvus. The horse is Sagittarius again. The man is Aquarius. The wheat is Virgo, the lady with the wheat stalk. Mm -hmm. And the wool comes from sheep, which is Aries. So you see how this all ties. It doesn't matter what book I go into. It's all it's all basically encoded the same way, right? Right. Yeah. Now, let's go back to the beginning. Answers to questions at the beginning. How Jesus was able to heal the blind. Now, remember, he's the son. He's a solar deity. Mm-hmm. Okay? Right. He's not the S-O-N. 
Okay. But in the story, in the biblical story, the blind man comes up to Jesus. He licks his fingers and then he touches the man on the eyes and he can see. Right. However, the sun does the same thing too. Right now, if you look around, the sun is out, we have sight. But when the sun goes down, we're blind again. So when the sun comes up and touches our eyes, we can see. All right. Now, how he walked on water. If you've ever gone fishing or seen a sunset on a lake or the ocean before, you can literally see that not only does the sun walk on water, but it also follows you if you start walking. Okay. Why he turned water into wine. That's not a parlor trick. That's a process. The reason God is considered a man and Mother Earth has always been considered a woman has to do with something of God's. It's his sacred fluid, the rain. In Hebrew, the word is shemen. We get the word semen from it. It's the sacred fluid. What happens is God's sacred fluid comes down onto Mother Earth, literally. And then as it rains, she gets pregnant and vegetation, life, fruits, trees grow. Okay? Okay. So that's why she's the mother and he's the father. Now, in Taurus, remember, that's when you plant. Taurus is also April showers bring May flowers. Everybody knows that. Yeah. Okay, so you plant the grapes and then they grow and they grow. It rains and it rains and it rains. And then in Libra, you pluck them and you turn them into wine. That's how you turn God's water into wine. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, it's it's not actually a parlor trick. It's a process. It's a it's a it's a it's a uh, alchemical process. So why he had 12 disciples, we went over that. But I'll give you one more example. Um, we know that Judas represents Scorpio because he's the betrayer and mm-hmm. scorpions betray with a kiss. They leave an imprint in your hand. That's why G- Judas betrayed with a kiss. But we can also talk about Simon Peter. Now, your name is Timothy, right? And they call Correct. you Tim. Yeah. Okay. Yep. My name is Micah. Sometimes they call me Mike. You know, there are names that you can give as a nickname that makes sense. But to go from Simon to Peter makes no sense why they would change it unless you know your astrology. Simon was a fisherman by trade. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jesus calls him Peter. Okay. So the fish are Pisces. Well, if you know the ruling planet of Pisces is Jupiter or Jew Peter, you'll see why his name becomes Peter. Okay. Because again, it's just celestial metaphors. I see you're liking this. I get it. I know. I I, I just, the light, the light's coming on. So, (laughs) okay. Now why he was betrayed with a kiss by Judas. We went over that. Mm -hmm. Why he was dead for three days. We went over that. Why is his birthday on December 25th? We went over that. Now, a lot of people are going to say Jesus was born September 11th, 3 AD. Okay. That's what they say. Okay. Jesus's last supper was a Passover meal that takes place in Aries. He dies in Aries. That's the story. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's the story. If I were to give you uh, cheat sheet notes before you wrote an essay. Okay. And I gave you keywords to use or phrases. What I went over earlier. Okay. With the keywords in every sign. That's how you're going to build a story. Okay. Okay. So yes, people will say he wasn't born on December 25th. He wasn't born at all. He's a solar deity. Okay. And I'm going to keep proving that to you. Okay. Okay. But that's basically the case. So it doesn't stop there. It's not just random passages in the Bible that could be decoded this way. We're going to go through the entire book of Matthew to show how deep this runs. You're going to like this, Tim. Okay. Now, what I've done here is I've put the Zodiac wheel on the left and I've highlighted the red. Okay, so you can follow along. I'll try and explain this as best as I can to listeners. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Matthew 3, 2, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. Each gospel begins at one of the four major points of the Zodiac and ends at one of them as well. The two solstices and the two equinox when connected in the Zodiac form a cross. This is known as the cross of God's son that he carries. The kingdom of heaven is Leo, whose ruling planet is the sun. This is the only sign that the sun rules over. This is the firmament between Cancer and Leo, the dividing lines. There's a saying in the Bible that says that the firmament shows God's handiwork. Now, when you're at a firmament, when you're between two signs, you can talk about either sign. So right now I'm between Cancer and Leo, right? So Mm -hmm. we could talk about lions or we could talk about crabs or we could talk about scarabs or we could talk about honey because the beehive cluster is there, right? This is starting to make sense a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, good. So the firmaments are the dividing lines. Now, the next passage, Matthew 3, 4, John's clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. So the camel hair and the locusts kind of stand out there, don't they? Yeah. Right. Well, if we take the most famous drawing of a man, Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian man, and superimpose it onto the Zodiac, we can make sense of it. Okay. Now, the head is in cancer. Everybody knows the Vitruvian man. So that's kind of stood up on the Zodiac. 
Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, cancer being the head, the mouth isn't cancer. That's why he eats the wild honey. Mouth, beehive cluster. Make yep. sense? Yep. Now, Leviticus 11, what's clean and unclean to eat? All flying insects that walk on all fours are to be regarded as unclean by you. There are, however, some flying insects that walk on all fours that you may eat. Those that have jointed legs for hopping on the ground. Of these, you may eat any kind of locust. So there's the locust. There's why he has it. Katie did cricket or grasshopper. So when the elites are trying to get you to eat bugs, this is where it's coming from. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. A little lower on the body. Now we're in Gemini because we went from cancer, Leo to cancer to Gemini. Again, those are all connecting signs. Gemini is a little lower. So you can see that's kind of like the the shoulders, the chest, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, a little lower on the body is the clothes made out of camel hair. There's a constellation in Gemini called Camelopardalis. So it's just a deeply encoded metaphor for that. So right now you have the head in the upper body so far. A little lower, we have Taurus, which is the next connecting sign. So we're still making patterns, which is sort of the midsection on the body, which is where you'd wear the belt. Taurus represents the bull and the female is the cow. So that's the, that's the uh, belt. That's the leather. Regarding the belt, Orion's belt sits between Taurus and Gemini. So you see how deeply encoded these metaphors are to basically align the stars in the systems? Yeah. yeah. Orion's belt sits between Taurus and Gemini. Now, next would be the baptism in the book, in Matthew. Now, how are we going to go from the beginning of Leo, right, to a water sign to signify the baptism? You would go across the zodiac. Cross signs, as they are known, are signs of opposite locations. For example, Aries and Libra are cross signs. This is very important. The signs, two most important signs are, or three most, are its two neighboring signs, And it's cross sign. Okay. Those are the patterns that you make. That's the patterns we see in the Bible. Here we see how it makes a leap from one firmament to the other. So the the connecting lines between Cancer and Leo, if you follow it across, takes you to the connecting line of Capricorn and Aquarius, which means you could talk about water, right? You could talk about goats on the right, which is Capricorn, or you could talk about water, which is Aquarius. The man with the water pitcher in Aquarius is personified as John the Baptist with the water. Makes sense? Makes sense. And to kind of slow down and let people know what we're looking at here. So Capricorn is sitting at 6 o'clock. Aquarius is sitting at 7 o'clock. And there's a firmament in between those or a line. Okay, if you're looking at a clock between 6 and 7. And then Cancer and Leo are sitting at 12 and 1. So if you draw that line in between the two of them straight down, that's what we're talking about. Now, for anybody that's listening, I, w- I want to tell you this. For anybody that's listening that finds this interesting, find me on social media. I have plenty of videos that I could send you of all my work, yeah, including yeah. this presentation that I'm doing with Tim. Okay, I appreciate you guys listening. But if you actually want to see the presentation, reach out to me on social and I'll send you the link. No problem. Yeah, absolutely. Okay? absolutely. So now, it's important to note, too, that John the Baptist and Jesus are always exactly six months apart. Look at this. Uh, look at this. Jesus is right there in Capricorn at the bottom. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's his birth. Yep. Okay. St. John is right on top. Now, if you turn that to the side, one goes down while one goes up, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. This is why in John, uh, I'm sorry. This is why John the Baptist is born on June 24th. Jesus is born on December 25th and will rise a degree a day. John the Baptist is born on June 24th and decrease a degree a day. This is why in John 3.30, John says, he must increase, but I must decrease. That's what he's talking about. It's also why St. John's Day in the Catholic calendar is exactly six months to the day of the birthday of Jesus. You can't make this stuff up. So we're going back to the Cancer Leo Furman of let, July 24th. Let me stop you real quick, Micah. So if, if Jesus is a sun god, what is St. John the Baptist? He's Aquarius. He's Aquarius. So he, he is not a physical presence at all. So none of these, none of these characters are real. Okay. You, you wouldn't read, you wouldn't read. I, it's a hard pill to swallow. I know I get it. And people are going to just write me off and that's fine if you're not ready to hear this. But the truth is, is that you wouldn't read Beowulf and think that the characters were real and it really happened. You wouldn't read the Odyssey or the Iliad and think that the same way. The Bible is written the same way. These characters aren't real. They're just telling the story of the sun over and over again. Okay. Okay. All right. So the next story is the temptation of Jesus. So we're going back to the Cancer Leo firmament of July 24th. Okay. This one is simple. What is 40 days from July 24th? He's tempted for 40 days. So count 40 days. That's all you have to do. Takes you to September 2nd. What is September 2nd? That's right in the middle of Virgo. The lady with the wheat stalk, the bread, remember? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What's the very next line? Matthew 4, 3. 
The devil says, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. Here we see the mention of bread, which tells you that the son is indeed in Virgo. The next passage, Matthew 5, 17 and 22. I did not come to abolish the law. And if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. Well, the law and the judgment is in Libra. So we went from Virgo to Libra. So those are connecting signs. So you're still following the pattern. Okay. Mm -hmm. Matthew 7, 15 and 16. Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep. And can you pick grapes from the thorn bushes? The sheep are the ram in Aries. And the grapes are in Libra. Once again, these are opposing signs. Moving along, Matthew 13. Later that same day, Jesus left the house and sat beside the lake. The story now moves from Libra to the barrier between Aquarius and Pisces, as he is right beside the lake or the two water signs. Its cross sign is the Leo Virgo firmament. As it's across from Virgo, the wheat stalk, the grains, is it ironic that Jesus' next parables are the wheat and the weeds, the mustard seed, and the yeast? Moving right along, next is the fishing net parable. So we cross the zodiac wheel again and go from Leo and uh, Virgo to Aquarius Pisces. Now we're next to Pisces. It's the fishing net parable, so we can talk about the fish. Mm -hmm. See how this works? Yep, directly across from each other. So Gemini is the sign of two men, technically twins. However, there's just a short mention of brothers in the next passage. He's just the carpenter's son, and we know Mary, his mother, and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. This ends in the firmament of Gemini Cancer. How do we know this? How do we know this? They're in Gemini, but it ends at the firmament. Follow the firmament of Gemini Cancer to its cross sign. That's Sagittarius Capricorn firmament, right? Yep. Okay. That day is December 21st. That's the last day of Sagittarius. That's the day of death. What's the very next passage? The next story is the death of John the Baptist. As I mentioned previously, the death comes at the end of Sagittarius. The firmament of Sagittarius Capricorn and the Gemini Cancer are opposing signs. So let's take this sentence, which sounds like it could be in the Bible, but isn't. I came up with this. If I say to you, the rulers were divided between war and love, it split the land in half. You could read that as a literal translation. Sure. The ruling planet of Aries is Mars, who's the god of war. The ruling planet of Libra is Venus, who's the goddess of love. I know we haven't gotten into ruling planets yet, but I'm just trying to give an intro to this. Okay. There is your war and love. If you connect it, you see what I did here? It literally splits the zodiac or the land in half. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Matthew 14, 17, and 32, but we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. Well, the bread is Virgo. The fish is Pisces. Those are opposing signs, again, with the pattern in the zodiac. But also, Pisces is the two fish, which is why Jesus feeds the masses with two fish. And as far as the five loaves of bread, where does the number five come from? The zodiac starts in Aries. Okay. If you add five signs from Aries, you get to Virgo. So that's why you have five loaves of bread. Hmm. Interesting. Now, this is the cross of God's son, son. We were just in Virgo and now next is Libra, which is law, wine and olives. Remember? Mm -hmm. What is the next story we get from Jesus? It's the story of the temple tax, the unforgiving debtor, divorce and marriage, and the vineyard worker, the parable of the vineyard worker. See, it's all it all connects. It all follows suit. This is how these stories were written with the cheat code. Now, next is Scorpio, the betrayer. This is where Judas betrays Jesus with the kiss. So we were in Virgo, right? Mm -hmm. Then we were in Libra. Now we're in Scorpio. Those are all connecting signs. And then next is Sagittarius. That's the death. So what happens next? Jesus is crucified. It's his death. So that's the book of Matthew. Do you see how this permeates through everything? Yeah, it, it just, it's, you follow the, you follow the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm seeing it. I'm just, I'm, I'm digesting it at the same time. I'm following the, 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 uh, the wheel and, the, and I'm seeing exactly how it, how it lines up with the stories. Yeah. 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 So Jesus disappears at 12 and comes back at 30. This has been a subject of great debate, but the answer is actually quite simple. What happens to a young Jewish boy at the age of 12? He becomes bar mitzvah. Mm -hmm. He becomes a man. So Jesus becomes a man and leaves to study. He starts his ministry at 30. But why? The ancient Jewish religion has roots in Saturnalia worship before it. That's why their day of rest is the Saturday or the Saturn day. So why 30? Saturnalia worshippers said that you were not allowed to become a teacher of anything until Saturn comes back to the point it was at when you were born. And it just so happens it takes Saturn 30 years to come back. So that's why he disappears at 12 and comes back at 30. Now watch this. Okay. The sun tells the hour of the day. The moon tells the day of the month. The zodiac tells the month of the year. 
making, okay? Okay. It's a perfect calendar that they spent thousands of years refining into these metaphorical stories till nowadays where we just can look at our computer and know what time of day it is, what day it is. Before we even leave the house, we know what the weather's going to be like. We right. take that for granted. Yeah, we do. <laughs> you know, the weathermen, even if they're half right, um, we take that for granted. They didn't have that. They had a sundial. Yeah. They had to know when winter was coming. They had to know when to plant. They had to know when to harvest. They had to know when to do certain things. Right. Okay. The Zodiac tells you that. Okay. And that's why they encoded this because it was a survival book. The Bible is basically a farmer's almanac, an ancient metaphorical farmer's almanac. That's what it basically is. Huh. Okay. Okay. Moses goes to the top to get the Ten Commandments. And when he comes down, he sees them worshiping a golden calf. So what's more likely? The Jews got run out of Egypt. They couldn't even let the bread rise, which is why we have matzah to this day. They, rise, they rushed to the desert with just the clothes on their back, but happened to carry enough gold. <clears throat> happened to carry enough gold between all of them, found welding equipment in the desert and built a giant statue. Is that more likely? Or this, it's a metaphor. The sun is the gold and the calf is the bull or Taurus. They were worshiping the age of Taurus. Whereas they're the Jews or the people of Aries. Moses went to the top of the mountain to get the new law for the new age. So he comes down, he breaks the commandments, becoming the first person to break the law. He becomes the first lawbreaker. And that's basically what happens. Now, chapter 125, Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Declaration of the Innocence Before the Gods of the Tribunal. I mentioned that the Bible was not even original. This is where the Ten Commandments come from. I'm just going to read you three. Okay. The swallower of shades who came forth from Kernet, I have not slain people, becomes thou shalt not kill. O doubly evil one who came forth from the Bruserite gnome, I have not had intercourse with a married woman. Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife. Mm -hmm. O he who prospers the common people who came forth from Asiut, I have not cursed a god. Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. If you were to have a copy of the Egyptian book, one, the book, uh, Egyptian book of the dead, open up the chapter 125, you'll find the Ten Commandments. Hmm. That's interesting, too. <sighs> okay, now... Okay. The ancient Egyptians used to worship the sun in Taurus. As you can see on the left, you have the bull with the, with the sun between its head and the hieroglyphs. Mm -hmm. They're telling you they're worshiping the sun in Taurus. The Jews are the people of Aries. So the Egyptian people start to fade after the age of Taurus and the Jews come up. Okay. They're the people of Aries, the ram. That's why the Jews blow the ram's horn to the sky during the holidays. It's Aries worship. Okay. Then the Jews start to fade after the age of Aries. The Christians come up during Pisces. It's why they have the Jesus fish. Right. Because it's Pisces. It's also why Jesus is able to feed the masses with two fish. The two fish are Pisces. Okay. The Vesica Pisces too. It's John 21. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. That's a random number. Well, numerology, you would take one, five, and three. That reduces to nine. That's a sacred number. But is that it? No. There's Vesica Pisces, which is on the left, which is between the two circles that interconnect. And you can see the Jesus fish, right? Mm -hmm. That mathematical equation for the Vesica Pisces is 247 over 153. So that's where the 153 comes from. Okay. okay. Now we're at the end of the age of Pisces. So the Christian numbers are going to go down. In, hundred, in a thousand years or hundreds of years, you're going to see that because I just followed the pattern between the Egyptians how they declined, how the Jews declined, and now it's turned for the Christians to decline, okay? Because you're in a new age. You need a new religion. And what do you have now? Back to Jerusalem.com. One World Religion headquarters set to open next year. See, they're not even wasting any time, okay? Every new Zodiac sign, there's a new holy book. People believe in it literally. They fight over it, and it keeps people in control, okay? Now, Genesis 3230. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Okay. You see the picture of the eye of Horus, right? Right. Well, on the right is a, is a uh, is the pineal gland. If you take a sagittal cut, which is you, you cut the skull literally in half and you open it like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. You'll see the pineal gland and the eyebrow ridge above it. The eyebrow ridge above it is the corpus callosum. In many Buddhist traditions, 49 days is the total mourning period, with prayers conducted every seven days across seven weeks. These Buddhists believe that rebirth takes place within 49 days after death. Okay, and it just so happens on modern day 3D sonogram scans, you can see now that on the 49th day of gestation, the pineal gland becomes visible. 
What does the pineal gland do? Everybody knows. It releases DMT while you sleep, which causes you to dream. Okay. It also releases melatonin. The pineal gland releases DMT twice in your life. Well, many times in your life, but, but only two occasions when you sleep to in your REM sleep so that you could dream. And as your body's shutting down, as you're about to die, your body floods with it. Mm. Okay. Now I'm going to get to the point now where I start to talk about Satan, Lucifer, hell, all that stuff that people are terrified of. Cause okay. what I like to tell people I like to do is I like to remove their religious fear and I like to let them live free. Okay. Sure. That, that's what I do. Okay. So hell, the flaming inferno, right? Yep. It's supposed to be a lake of fire. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Well, how do we detect pain in the human body? Me, I wake up in the morning and I scream. I have it all over the place. <laughs> there you go. But what in your body detects it? Would it be this, the nervous system? Yeah, nerve endings, yeah. Brain, spinal cord, nerve endings, neurons, right? Let me ask you a question. Sure. When you die and you give up your ghost and you, you become a soul, not talking about where you go, mm-hmm. but talking about the fact that you lose your nervous system, how are you going to be burning in a lake of fire? How are you going to detect pain without that? It's a good question. I don't you're know not. how you would. You're not. Yeah. Win- I mean, hell is actually winter. Hell is winter on earth. And I'm going to show you. The idea of a fiery pit where you burn for all eternity is ridiculous when you think about it. Hell is actually winter on earth. Why? It's cold and the vegetation, and the beautiful flowers and the plants are dead. The trees shed their leaves and bear no fruit. It's freezing cold out. People tend to get sick more often. Dangerous animals, if they're not hibernating or starving and scrounging for food, it's dangerous for humans. We live in a modern society. Could you imagine how much worse it would be thousands of years ago? Yeah. Okay. Now watch yeah. this. The Italian word for winter is inverno. Flip a letter inferno and pervert its meaning. You get the concept of hell. This picture that I have that you guys can't see, but if you look at um, Satan in Dante Alighieri's The Divine Comedy, okay, Satan's in the bottom level of hell and it's frozen. This is an early drawing of it. It's frozen. You know, he knew that hell was frozen, okay, because hell is frozen on earth, okay? Okay. Now, Satan and Lucifer, Satan does not exist, okay? He's not a red devil with a tail and a pitchfork. In fact, the earliest paintings of him in the 900s, he was actually blue. Hence, you get the Duke Blue Devils. Okay, uh, right. Hebrew word for Satan is Hashatan, which literally translates to adversary. So two UFC fighters, two basketball teams, two bowlers, they're actually Satans to one another. That's what Satan means. It got completely twisted and perverted. And as far as Lucifer goes, he's known as the light bringer. So what happens in Genesis 1-3? And God said, let there be light. Everyone knows that. Mm-hmm. Well, how can there be light without the light bearer? Without the light bringer, Lucifer was the one who was in charge of bringing the light. He's, Im- he's immediately mentioned in the Bible, if not th- by the name, then by action and purpose. He's also known as the morning star, right? You've heard that too, right? Right, yeah. The morning star is known as the planet Venus. And why? Because if you go outside and you look at the sun as it's just cracking up in dawn, okay, and it's starting to come up, there's a bright light above it, okay? That's Venus. Every morning, it announces the arrival of God's only begotten sun the light of the world, Jesus, the sun. Lucifer is also known to have a pentagram. That's his symbol. If you continue with Lucifer as Venus, if you follow Earth and Venus's orbit around the sun in a year's time, they almost connect at five points. When you connect those five points, you get the pentagram. You see it? Yep. Okay, so that's how you get the pentagram. All right? Now, this is the rudimentary phallic symbol. It's the original penis, so to speak. It's known as the spear. It's just a triangle. Mm -hmm. This is the rudimentary symbol of the womb. It's the chalice. It's the feminine. It's the triangle pointing down. The star of David is the joining of the two. It's a hermaphrodite, so to speak. Okay. There's more sex magic in the Bible that you think. Okay. Mm -hmm. Baphomet too uh, is not evil. Okay. Baphomet is a a guy with a goat's head, right? It's basically a goat. With, with, with a pair of tits on him because he represents the male and the female. You ever wonder why Baphomet has a chest? It's because he represents the male and the female. It's, it's ancient pagan. It has nothing to do with, with Satan. And Satan has nothing to do with anything either. Mm-hmm. Now, this is more sex magic. This is a holy interpretation of, the, of, the, um, of, the, of Solomon's temple. Okay. okay? Mm-hmm. I'm going to show you how this works. Okay, You can just Google it and look at it. 
Okay, Solomon is not a name of a person. He didn't exist. He's a combination of three words for the sun, because everything's about the sun in the Bible. Sol, S-O-L, or sun in Latin. Om, or sun in Buddhism. And On, O-N, was the city of light, Heliopolis in Greece. Solomon, okay? On was the city of light. That's why when you go into a bedroom, to be enlightened, you have to turn the lights on. Okay, it carries over into now. Okay. Okay. This was created using sex magic. So Yaquin and Boaz represent the testicles from the view. The porch is the base of the penis. The holy place is the shaft and the holy of holies is the head. The arc or the hole of the penis is where the DNA information Torah is stored. The store chambers represent the female wound and the two entrances to represent the mother fallopian tubes. Do you see how this looks like a rudimentary penis going into a vagina? Yeah, I, I can see that. Sure. Okay. Yep. What about Samson and Delilah? Is this another story about the sun? Yes, it is. Samson in Hebrew, the word is Shimshon. Okay. That means little sun. And Delilah, what is the root of Delilah is Lila, which means night. In Hebrew, when you say good night to someone, you say Lila Tov. That means good night. Okay. So what happens to Samson? He gets his hair cut. He goes blind. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is a story of the night overtaking the sun, overtaking the day. The Egyptians had the same thing, too. They had Horus taking the 12 steps in the sky. Okay. Well, you can ask where Horus is. That's what they used to say. Where is Horus? Nowadays, it's evolved. We say, what hour is it? Or what hour is it? And the hour is uh, an anagram for Horus. Okay. Okay. This, and you had basically Set, who would chase Horus into the underworld. And then every day, um, he would come out. The sun would come out, Horus would come out again, and every night he'd be chased away. That's why we have a sunset. Ah, uh -huh. okay. all right. What about Jonah in the body of the whale? In the Hebrew, the words are dag gadol, which translates to great giant fish. He's in it for three days. It's the three days you see reoccurring in the Bible over and over again. The sun walking sideways like the crab for three days. Daniel in the lion's den. It's a story revolving around two signs in astrology. Daniel the man, Aquarius, and the lions, which are Leo the lion. Again, those are opposing signs. What about Abraham and Sarah? Abraham's name was Abram before he was made Abraham. Abram is a combination of two words. Abba, Ab or Abba in father, means father in Hebrew. And Ram, which means Ram, father Ram. So he's father of the people of Aries, the Abrahamic religion. Okay, he's the father of Aries. He's the god of Aries. Okay, Abram goes back to Brahma. Sarah goes back to Saraswati. So it's Brahma and Saraswati become Abraham and Sarah. Okay, so that goes back to Hinduism. It's hmm. not original. Okay, Lot and Lot's wife in Sodom and Gomorrah. In the ancient times, people were paid in salt. That's where the word salary comes from. Salt. Why? Because it preserved the meat. And when you killed a cow and you didn't eat it, and one day it would go bad. Salt kept it viable for longer. There was no refrigeration back then. Remember that. Mm -hmm. No calendars, no refrigeration. Salt was the highest currency aside from gold and silver. So when she turned into a pile of salt, you have to think about it like leaving Las Vegas, gambling, hookers, debauchery, and turning back into a pile of money. That's, what he's, she, that's why she turns into a pile of salt. And people are like, yeah, salt, whatever. No, there's a reason it's salt. Right. Yeah. Now, there's a town in Israel called Megiddo which a third century church was found under another church. Basically some guy slipped and put his foot through the church. And when they looked into the hole, they saw like another church below it. Oh, wow. So they dug this church up. This church is one of the oldest churches known to man. It's from the two hundreds. It's in the third century. In the center of the floor, as you can see here is a mosaic of the two fish Pisces. The ancients before Constantine knew that Jesus was the Pisces God. They knew this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Megiddo is also the root word Armageddon which is where the war on earth and the rapture is supposed to begin. Right. So America was not founded as a Christian nation. I want to get this out. This is important for people to understand this because people argue it all the time and it's not true. And the day will come when the mystical generation of Jesus by the Supreme being as his father in the womb of a virgin will be classed with the fable of the generation of Minerva in the brain of Jupiter. That's Thomas Jefferson in a letter to John Adams. What influence, in fact, have Christian ecclesiastical establishments had on civil society? In many instances, they have been upholding the thrones of political tyranny. In no instance have they been sent as the guardians of the liberties of the people. That's James Madison. And then my favorite, 
The Christian religion is a parody on the worship of the sun, in which they put a man called Christ in the place of the sun and pay him the adoration originally paid to the sun. That's Thomas Paine. The founding fathers, by the way, were in their late teens and the early 20s when they wrote our, con- our country's laws. Imagine that. Imagine how bad education has gotten since that. Mm-hmm. This is before central banking took over and ruled everything. The country was not founded as a Christian nation, and the 20-year-olds knew it. Okay? Now uh, let's talk about a couple other things. Well, what else let, me, let me expound on that point. And, and I, I think a lot, of, a lot of people don't realize this. A lot of the founding fathers were, were Masons, and right. Masons don't practice Christianity. And I think a lot of people— Well, actually, you can ask me any question. What's that? You can ask me any question. I can ask you any question. Oh, oh, okay. I see. I see. I see what you're saying. You Um, can ask me any question. Um, I'll I'll let you say what you got to say. That's fine. But the the fact of the matter is, is that there was a, there was a freedom of religion that was put into the the constitution uh, to practice what you will. Um, And, and I I believe that was for a point. There was a point to that, but it's misconstrued by I think almost everybody in America, with the exception of, of Masons, and that is that, you know, people, and I want to say, how should I put this, Micah? Um, it is, it's misconstrued, I think, by a lot of politicians as well. They get up there and they, they spout that this is a Christian nation, and that's where it gets misconstrued the most is by politicians themselves. Right. And it was not. Um if you look at if you look even at Washington D.C. and the outlay of Washington D.C., this nation was built by Masons. Yep. So the fact of the matter remains is you're right. This is not a Christian nation. It was never built as a Christian nation. It was never supposed to be. It was never supposed to be. So, but there is a freedom to practice whatever religion you choose to practice. There and, is, and you're absolutely my, my, right. My about point that. was simply that not only was it not founded as a Christian nation. But many of the founding fathers abhorred Christianity. Yeah. Yep. They did. And that's the and 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 that is a tough pill, I think, for a lot of people to swallow if they choose to look at it because people want to because Christianity is the overwhelming uh religion that is practiced in America. They want to put the values on the founding fathers, and that was not the value of the founding fathers. No. Far from it. So I mean, look I, at Thomas Paine. This was in the 1700s. He knew that Jesus was the son. Yeah. So I, I think that's that's hard for that's hard for a lot of people to swallow. It's like it's like uh, it, you know it, it, this is the only parallel I can draw it to, and and people might get upset at me for saying this as well. It, it's like people trying to put values on Walt Disney. Uh, people choose to see Mickey Mouse as he is today, but go back and watch some some Mickey Mouse cartoons from the 20s or some Disney cartoons from the 20s. Disney was not always touchy-feely. There was a lot of politically incorrect things in Disney cartoons right. uh, through the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Right. It, well, it, also look at any of the uh, the fairy tales. Look at Grimm's fairy tales. Look yes, at, you know, yeah. Hans Christian Andersen. Yes. You know, yeah. these were horrific stories. Right. That were very lightened up for the masses. Exactly. So, yeah. To to expound on your point, um, yeah, it, it completely agree with you. America was not founded as a Christian nation, and right. and I think I think people need to to wake up to that. And I think if they did, people would be more accepting of other people's relig- religious values, re- religious uh, practices. Uh, because I think people do get intolerant because they believe Christianity is the the founding religion of our forefathers, and it is not. Correct. Yeah. Should I keep going? Yeah, keep going. I'm sorry. I just wanted to stop stop you on that point. So go ahead. So this is the swastika, mm-hmm. right? Right. The swastika, if you read Wikipedia, for example, talks about its origins of ancient times from ancient religions and its peaceful meaning. Again, tweak it a little and pervert the meaning. By tweaking it, I mean you invert it. That's what the the, uh, the Nazis did. They inverted it. Yes. They turned it on its face. They mirror imaged it. 
Okay. And you get the modern day symbol that we will never reclaim as peaceful, but it goes further than that. The swastika isn't Buddhist or Hindu, Babylonian, Syrian, or Sumerian. It's actually astrology. Hmm. This is the oldest swastika that we've found. It's 17,000 years old and it's from the Ukraine. What is the swastika? Well, it's astrology. If you take Polaris, the North Star, and you take a picture of the uh, Big Dipper on the solstices and the equinoxes, as you can see here, you get the swastika. So they noticed this pattern on those four days, and they put it together, and then they, they made it a symbol. Interesting. 17,000 years ago. Wow. Saturn discovered in 1610. This is, from, this is when you Google it. When was Saturn discovered? They say Galileo discovered it. Yet we all know about the ancient Saturnalia festivals and the basis of the Abrahamic Hebrew religion. It's a flat-out lie. 1,700 years ago, Julian the Apostate, who was the nephew of Constantine, tried to get everyone back to sun worship. Before Constantine, Christians were known as Heliognostics. And Helios in Greek means sun, and Gnosis means knowers. They were sun worshippers. They knew this. Okay, 17, 1,700 years ago, he talked about the sun being the fiery chariot that the planets danced around. So they knew about heliocentrism in the 300s. Okay, we've okay. just simply lost that. Hmm. Now, this is where it gets interesting, because I'm going to show you how you'd use modern day events with astrology. Okay. Okay. When do you kill John F. Kennedy? November 22nd, the handover date from Scorpio to Sagittarius. Scorpio being the betrayer because he was betrayed and dies in Sagittarius because the sun dies in Sagittarius. Why is January 1st New Year's Day? Neil deGrasse Tyson has gone on record saying that nothing special happens on January 1st or December 31st. He's wrong, and I've tried to call him out on it. Something interesting happens. It's our new year in the world because at midnight on December 31st, if you look up at high as you can into the sky, you'll see the north. I wrote North Star, but it's actually not North Star. It's actually Sirius, the dog star. Okay. So forgive me for that, but it is Sirius, not North Star. Okay. You see Sirius at its height. It does not get any higher than that. Then follow a straight line down to Earth. Then follow a straight line down to the sun. It's a perfect alignment. Otherwise, we should theoretically have a New Year's around uh, in Aries, right? Around the Passover, the Easter, or September 21st in the, in the fall equinox, where the, uh, the Jews celebrate the New Year. Hmm. Okay. Incidentally, the Jews celebrate the New Year in, uh, in um, Libra. Right. Oh, okay. Which is the justice, the judgment. Right. Eight days after the Jewish New Year, you have the Jewish Day of Judgment, which is Yom Kippur. Right. It's the day they pray to God. They don't eat or drink all day. They pray to God that uh, they will be kept in the Book of Life for another year. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Why do they always crash the stock markets in Libra? I don't think you knew this, but no. Panic of 1907, October 1907. Wall Street crash of 1929, October 24th, 1929. Black Monday, October 19th, 1987. Friday the 14th mini crash, October 13th, 1989. Stock market downturn of 2002, October 9th, 2002. All the main crashes happen in Libra. Why? Because it's the judgment. We're being judged. They manipulate the stock markets to crash in Libra. You ever seen something like this? This is the first time I've ever heard of this, to be honest with you, Micah. I Wow, you're right, though. It, it, it always happens in October. It always happens there. Symbolically, too, one of the greatest point games. They're all in Aries. 324, 2020, 4, 6, 326, 4, 8, 4, 17, 330, 326. It's always in Aries because it's the beginning of the year. The sun is on its way up instead of down. Okay, so that's when wow. they invest all their money is in, is in Aries. And you crash the markets in Libra. OK, wow. using the same decoding that I gave you. OK, now the Roman Catholic Catechism 2116. All forms of divination are to be rejected. Recourse to Satan or demons conjuring up the dead or other practices falsely supposed to unveil the future. Consulting horoscopes, astrology, palm reading, interpretation of omens and lots, the phenomena of clairvoyance and recourse to mediums all conceal a desire for power over time, history, and in the last analysis, other human beings, as well as a wish to conciliate hidden powers. They contradict the honor, respect, and loving fear that we owe to God alone. Abu Dawood, it is suggested that the prophet Muhammad stated, whoever seeks knowledge from the stars is seeking one of the branches of witchcraft, that of which is inherently forbidden in Islam. So I ask you a question. Mm -hmm. With all these obvious astrological connotations and connections, why is astrology specifically banned from Catholicism in Islam? Because you're giving away the secrets. Yep. 
you're starting to see, right? Yeah. Okay. Now let's go into some, um, let's go into some sports. Okay. Okay. You familiar with the Phoenix Suns? Yeah. Well, what's the story of Phoenix? Phoenix is, uh, Phoenix is the story of the sun, of the story of Jesus. It's a flaming ball of life, the sun. Okay. The Phoenix, it's a flaming ball that dies and it's reborn from its ashes. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Just like Jesus, just like the sun. Phoenix and sun means the same thing. That's why they're called the Phoenix suns. What about the women's Phoenix team? The Phoenix Mercury. Mercury is the ruling planet of Virgo, the only woman sign. So how else are things encoded into everyday entertainment? Remember this movie, Face Off? Yeah. Yep. 1990s movie Face Off starring Nicolas Cage and John Travolta. Well, what are their characters' names? Nicolas Cage's character is Caster Troy and his brother is Pollux Troy. That's what I told you originally the names of uh, Gemini were. Yeah, okay. Yeah. What about Travolta? His name is Sean Archer. Well, the Archer is Sagittarius, the man with the bow and the arrow. Those are opposing signs. So you see how they encode this? Okay. Oh, yeah. Algol. Algol. There's a demon star named Algol, A-L-G-O-L, that has a long history of evil attached to it. In Batman Begins, the evil character's name is literally Raz Algol, who gets his name from Algol or Al Ghul. Okay. Do you remember this music video, The Cranberry Zombie? Yeah. 1990s video, Cranberry Zombie. Here, Dolores O'Riordan is painted gold like the sun, and her head dressing represents the rays of the sun, much like Jesus in the crown of thorns. But is it that? What's the very next scene? So you have the sun here. What's the next scene? It's the sun on the cross with the little Sagittarius about to kill her. You see that? You see how they embed yep. this kind of astro theology into modern stuff? Yep. Yep. Katy Perry's Dark Horse video. Here we see the Eye of Horus, the Illuminati symbol. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. What about here? 700 sheep and goats were arranged in the shape of syringe to encourage vaccination. Well, you know what the sheep are? The sheep is Aries. The goat is Capricorn. Okay. Corey Good, who is this, uh, he's this pretty big UFO guy. Mm -hmm. He retweeted this that I wrote. Variant Omicron Draconis. Okay. Omicron Draconis is the name of Draco, the dragon they talk about in Revelation. Its tail starts in Sagittarius. The Omicron variety was first announced in Sagittarius. What happens at the end of Sagittarius, December 21st, the day of death? You have to ask why they always crash the stock market in Libra. Okay. Why was the only do dog to die during 9 11 in New York named Sirius? Sirius the dog. Okay, that was if you look at the newspaper articles back then. I'm from Long Island, New York, so we lost people. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, if you look at news stories, they kept talking about how one dog died, and its name was Sirius. They encoded in there. Okay. Okay. Homosexuality in the Bible. Everyone knows about Leviticus 18:22. However, is it what really is said there? The Greek word arsenokotai shows up in two different versions of the Bible in Greek but was not translated to mean homosexual until 1946. In the 1800s, the German Bible said, man shall not lie with young boys as he does with a woman, for it is an abomination. Leviticus 18.22, same with Leviticus 20.13, young boys. 1 Corinthians, the word arsenokotai, and it's important to mention, as before I continue, mm -hmm. that the Bible was written in Hebrew, but everyone at the time knew that if you were an intellect, you wrote and read in Greek. So 1 Corinthians becomes boy molesters will not inherit the kingdom of God. If you were to grab Martin Luther's original German translation from 1534, they used the German word Nabenschander. Nabben is a boy. Schander means molester. The first time homosexual appears in the German translation is in 1983. Hmm. Okay, so this is a mistranslation that has caused so much angst and anger and division in families and, and problems in the world. Right. over a stupid mistranslation yeah okay yep where people fear that if they don't believe that homosexuals go to hell or that they're sinful that they're going to burn in hell which doesn't exist or they're going to see satan and lucifer which are just satan doesn't exist and lucifer is just venus yeah yep okay? now i'm going to go into i'm going to give you one example of uh of the quran okay okay one example okay okay you're familiar with the 72 virgins? Yes. Yeah. You know, that's what they all do it for, right? That's why they all kill themselves. Yes. Yeah. For the okay? reward. It's astrology. Yeah. Okay. There's a star called 70 Virginis, which borders Virgo. That's the 70. There's one Virgo, one Virgo, one virgin in Virgo. So that makes 71. Okay. Plus the virgin that you marry on earth have a family with. That's the 72 virgins that you're going to give. 
it's all astrology. Okay. You're not going to go up there to paradise and find women. That's not how this works. This is all astrology. Just like everything is all astrology. I don't mean to giggle, but that's, it's also very sad. You know, I mean, because you you have a human who's dedicated to a cause who, when you talk about a suicide bomber, you talk about somebody who takes up a cause um, and they believe they're righteous and they do it for 72 virgins in heaven. And you find out on the other side, you just did it for nothing. Yep. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. So I have a book series where I talk about all this kind of stuff, including the following topics. Gematria, etymology, numerology, astronomy, astrology, astrotheology, out-of-body experiences, the Akashic records, symbology, remote, remote viewing, religious secrets, capstones of the pyramids, mystery school channelers, near-death experiences, DMT monitoring, lucid dreaming, acoustic levitation, physics and quantum physics, psychotherapy, psychology, spiritual guides and shared dreaming, crystal technology, most of it is conspiracies that not many people know about, corruption and secret societies, though. Okay. Okay? My point, once again, is not that those ancient people told literal stories and we are now smart enough to take them symbolically, but that they told them symbolically and we are now dumb enough to take them literally. So I had a fan send me this in. I wanted to read it. Sure. So essentially, the Bible is just a big farmer's almanac, survival guide, verbal astrological map that reads like a compilation of Grimm's fairy tales or grimoires basically giving the rundown of the growing season from start to finish and over again with the final reward being open chakras and enlightenment. And uh, that my friend is my presentation. Well, now I, I, in that very interesting presentation, there are a couple things I did want to ask you about as well that, that are kind of off the beaten track of the uh, presentation. One of them, which you just mentioned and it intrigues me. So if we could, could we talk a little bit about acoustic levitation? Sure. Hit me with it. Cause I, you know, we, we talk about, and I don't know if this even relates at all or not, but we talk about tools of, of the ancients and, and ways of how you could have built the pyramids. Does that have anything to do with it? Yeah. That's basically my, uh, I, I talk about acoustic levitation in my third book. Okay. Um, but basically what it is, is, um you can literally go if you go to youtube mm -hmm. you can type in uh rock or stone acoustic levitation yeah they send sound waves at it and it basically lip vibrates it lifts these giant monolithic things into the sky like they're like that like you threw a penny in the air really so yeah. tell, tell me this micah and and again we'll, we'll we'll have to do another show where we talk about talk about it in depth but if like say the the average person listening at home right now if i'm if i'm sitting there and and i think well that's really cool i'd like to try it or i'd like to try doing something where i could acoustically lift something how would you go about doing something like that you need it's got to be in a lab it's got to be that we've lost that ability okay um for for thousands of years there's another thing that we do too it's called um i think it's called sonic drilling sure so if you you go to Google, you go to, you go to uh, Wikipedia or something, mm -hmm. and you look up uh, tuning forks, right? Yeah. You'll find that they say they're maybe 120 years old at most. That's nonsense, because if you look at the Egyptian hieroglyphs, they have these giants holding the tuning forks. And why did they do that? Well, you ever see a stone with a perfectly whole circle in it? Like a, 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 a stone with like a perfect, perfect board circle through it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. What they basically do is you take a two. So limestone has a frequency. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. And what you do is you take a tuning fork or you build a tuning fork to that frequency. What happens is when you put the tuning fork on the limestone and you smack the tuning fork, it vibrates at the same frequency as the limestone and it cuts through it like butter. Okay. Oh, okay. So that's what they that's what they used to do. That's how they make those. You ever see those stone walls where there's such where they're they're like Jenga pieces that just perfectly fit together? That's what they did. That's what they used. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, I you know the topic itself of acoustic levitation, we think of 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 tools and how you would make the the pyramids and there's two two th schools of thought that that always intrigued me and and the one that I always wanted the one side I always wanted to take was that 
these were tools that humans came up with. You know, you have the school of thought that says that, well, aliens came down and helped us, and, and, and that's how it got done. Well, that, that to me suggests that humans have always been the lazy lot and that we, we always wanted help in doing this. And I, I always came with the idea of, no, we've always had access to tools. We, we, I think we were smarter as we were an older race. Well, as I've read you, as I've read you my entire presentation and I went through the biblical phrases, Mm -hmm. okay. I make it really simple. Well, that's the one thing I do when I teach astrotheology is I try and make it really simple. Like guys, here are the 12 signs, here are the keywords. Yeah. And then I go through the passages and I, do you see how deeply encoded they are though? Yeah. So they're they're yeah. very simple to read when you use the keywords, right? When you use the right. cipher, right? They're very, very easy to read, but do you see how deeply encoded they are? Of course they were smarter. Yeah. You know, yeah. the Rockefellers since the early 1900s, when they took over the school boards, have just been dumbing us down. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it's obvious. I mean, we, it's even obvious over the last, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm 52 years old and, and I can tell that, you know, even in the last 20 to 30 years, it, I, I, I don't want to get too political with this, but you can tell that although children have a capacity to want to be smarter, I, I should say they have the mental ability to be smarter. You look at how much is done now with technology and how it seems like, What's a good way of putting this, Micah? Um, children have the capacity to be so much more these days than I ever could have been in high school. Okay, right. the the it's if you if you if you take it like a computer, there's so much so much capacity to be so much more than there was thirty years ago with a computer. Children have so much more these days to be than I ever was in high school, but it's what you put in it, you know? Um, right. You know, and, and you know, I'm sorry, common core math is so, so bad these days. Um, but it's what you put in the children these days and, 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 you know, and, and what, what exactly, I know that my point's not coming across very well, but, but there are some some kids out there, and and you know I I have nephews that are twenty and eighteen respectively that are smart as a whip, probably smarter than I ever was at that age, and uh, they their knowledge base is so much better, so much greater than mine. But you think of what could have been put into them right. in the time they were in school, um, and the knowledge that they could go out and seek is is amazing. I mean, they could be at thirty what much much more than what i am at 50 yeah um i hope i hope you know my my goal is to inspire someone like i was inspired to talk about this and to to to, to study and do my own work on this mm-hmm. i hope that, that i get to inspire someone who's much much younger than me that can blow me out of the water and teach me some things yeah oh, because yeah. i was lost until i found the people that showed me this yeah and uh now i'm free you know, and I just want to alleviate people's, you know, their, their fear of hell, their fear. Cause you know what they say, you know how in the Bible it constantly says um, in hell, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Mm-hmm. Well, when do you chatter your teeth in the fucking hot or the cold? Well, in the cold, obviously. Exactly. So hell is cold. Well, let me ask you this. Hell is frozen. Because uh, I mean, you bring up, the fact that there's no hell, but but I take it you've heard. I mean, let's face it. Yeah, I, I know you've probably been into the paranormal for a while. Um, Art Bell had a, a recording of supposedly they dropped the microphone down into the earth's crust and got recordings of what they thought was actual sounds from hell. It's out there, you know. It's it's on YouTube. There's there's um, there's been. Re- repeated actually i think it's been repeated a couple of times that microphone that's been dropped down into that that the earth's crust i think it was done in russia uh it might well, have, have been, you ever heard of a, have you ever heard of a gartha i think we're, we might be talking about the same thing but but go ahead and tell me what that is the gartha is the inner earth that's where that's where there's yeah. life in the yeah. Inner yeah. earth yeah 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 um but so it wouldn't surprise me that doesn't that doesn't make it a, that doesn't make it hell but but this was this was distinctly wailing, gnashing, like you were describing, and it was screams, and it was, and and I wonder if 
if you had, I, I first of all, I wondered, had you heard that recording? And second, if you had, what, what would be your interpretation of it? I haven't heard the recording. Okay. I've okay. heard of it, but I okay. haven't heard the recording, so I'm not going to speak on it. Okay. All right. That's fair. That's very fair. Um, switching gears then, um, I, I'll ask you this. We, we were talking about the, the pyramids and acoustic levitation. W- would you believe the purpose of the pyramids would be then? Um, I wrote that in my second book. You wrote that in your second book? Okay. Yeah. I uh, answer all these questions. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. You know, like, I, like I said, they're Dan Brown thrillers, but they're very real. The information is very real. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Well, let's do this. We'll, uh, we'll have you back another day and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about those books. We'll, um, uh, uh, we'll, we'll point people out to those books in the meantime. Uh, Micah, Micah Dank has the Into the Rabbit Hole series out there and his other books. Again, Micah, how can people uh, seek those books out? You guys, find me on Twitter at Real Mr. Dank, spell out Mr. Um, Facebook and Instagram, Micah Dank. Um, I'll send you videos if you reach out to me or I'll reach out to you. I'll send you videos. You can buy the books through me. Um, like I said, we're trying to turn it into a TV series right now. Um, six books are out so far. I'm literally, the seventh one is with my publisher. Um, I also have a children's astrology book coming out with my astrologer. Uh, so I have those two with the publisher and I'm, I'm I'm about halfway, maybe a little more than halfway done with my eighth book. And I think I'm going to wrap it up after the eighth book, but it's basically, it's like, it's save the world stuff, you know? Yeah. All right. Very cool. We'll have a link in the uh, description of the show, by the way, if you uh, if you didn't catch all that uh, to so you can click on that and uh, and visit uh, Micah's Twitter and and, uh, his social media. And so you can uh, catch up with that, catch up with the videos and and learn more for yourself. Micah, I want to thank you very much for being with us today and um, educating us a little bit on uh, on on everything. I mean, it was it was quite eye opening and uh, and quite interesting at that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yep. Thank you. Folks, that'll do it for this week for Darkness Radio. I want to thank you very much for tuning in for a great week of uh, shows. We'll have more great shows for you next week. Just want to remind you, if you want to support the show, it's real easy. Just go to Stitcher.com, click on the premium button, and subscribe to Stitcher Premium. You not only get Darkness Radio ad-free, you also get True Crime Tuesday ad-free, and you also get Dumb Crime Stupid Criminals added to it. You also get to expand your audio universe and get all of the Stitcher Premium podcasts ad-free. Hundreds of Stitcher Premium podcasts uh, under that roof for just under $5 a month. And it goes to help your buddies here at Darkness Radio. So go ahead and do that. Stitcher.com, click on the premium button, and enjoy the Stitcher Premium universe. Want you to have a great weekend. Enjoy yourselves. Uh, check out the Darkness Radio archives and uh, be sure to take care of each other and be sure to send out your thoughts and prayers to the people of Ukraine who are undergoing a very tough time right now. Uh, both refugees who have gotten over the border in Poland and uh, the people who are still there who are under oppression right now uh, from Russian soldiers. We want to keep uh, keep them in our thoughts and uh, send them positive energy. We'll see you next week, everybody. For the best in paranormal podcasting, this has been Darkness Radio.